Good evening. Welcome to the Ent Center for the Arts at UCCS. My name is David Siegel. I'm the executive director here at the Ent Center. And we are thrilled to have you joining us for this evening's lecture just not quite as excited as we are to have this incredible exhibition in our space for these, these few months. Uh, I want to start um, actually not related to this exhibition, but just to, to answer the question that I know is on all of your minds, which is what's happening with the GOKA director? And uh, we are very close to making an announcement, so please keep your eyes peeled for more information on that probably next week. So on to the, the reason that you are here, and that's the UC UCCS Visiting Artists and Critics Series. The series was founded in 2011 as a collaborative program between the UCCS Galleries of Contemporary Art, or GOCA, and the Visual Art and Art History programs in the UCCS Visual and Performing Arts Department. Over the past decade, the series has invited artists and scholars to the UCCS campus to present public lectures and meet with undergraduate students in classes and workshops and settings. I want to uh, especially thank our GOKA season sponsors that make this exhibition and uh, lectures like this possible. And they include Colorado Creative Industries, the City of Colorado Springs Lodging and Automobile Rental Tax, or LART, El Pomar Foundation, the B. Vradenberg Foundation, as well as the members of the GOKA Community Advisory Board and members of the GOKA PAC. Let's give them all a round of applause. You may have figured out that this is a big deal exhibition for GOKA. I think it is perhaps the most ambitious exhibition uh, that GOKA has taken on in this space at the End Center. And it wouldn't be possible without exhibition sponsors. Um, they are uh, Linda Riefler and the Boyot family, Sarah Townsend Gerhardt and the Gerhardt family, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, um, with additional support from CU Boulder Art and Art History Department, the CU Boulder Idea Forge, Dencal Metal, Demirge, Aspen Wood Products, Stoneleaf Pottery, and Seidel City. One of the things I have learned about Martha over the last several months is she has an incredible network and incredibly generous friends. And this, this exhibition would not be possible without both Martha's talent, but also her hard work uh, fundraising and supporting the work. So let's give all of the exhibition sponsors a round of applause. Lastly, I want to say a special thanks to Lene Bowman Cravens, Abigail Kapetsky, and the entire GOKA student staff. I watched this exhibition come together over, gosh, six weeks this summer, and I think we had 17 UCCS um, students and, and staff total helping put together this exhibition, working right alongside Martha. And I am in awe of their hard work, their creativity, and their professionalism. So a deep thanks from me to all of the GOKA staff. And so with that, now it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, GOKA's interim director, Lene Bowman Cravens. Wow, thank you, David. Um, so before I introduce Martha, because I know that's why you're all here, um, I want to acknowledge and thank, again, our amazing GOKA team that put the exhibition together. So Abigail Kopetsky, our gallery manager, and our wonderful student team. Um, they worked so hard over the summer months to make the exhibition and the public piece happen. Um, it would not be possible without all the work that they've done. I also want to thank and acknowledge our wonderful volunteers and supplemental staff who assisted in the install. It was not just a GOKA team effort, it was a community effort, so there's just no way this would not have been possible without all of their work. Um, I also want to thank GOKA's former director, Daisy McGowan, for bringing this exhibition to UCCS and passing the torch off to us to complete and take it through the finish line. Um, and lastly, I want to acknowledge the hard work of our guest curator, Dr. Joy Armstrong, who worked alongside GOKA to make the exhibition happen and be as wonderful it is today. So thank you all for your help on this exhibition. <laughs> All right, so on to the good stuff. So tonight's lecture is by visiting artist Martha Russo. Martha was born in 1962 in Milford, Connecticut. She earned her Bachelor's of Art in 
arts degree in developmental biology and psychology in 1985 from Princeton University. Um, while vying for a spot on the 1984 United States Olympic field hockey team, she suffered a career-ending injury. After recovering from surgery, Martha was attracted to the physical nature of sculpture and ceramics. She began to study studio art in Florence, Italy, and continued her studies in ceramics at Princeton. In 1996, she earned her Master's of Fine Arts here at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, Martha has been exhibiting her work nationally in many venues, including the Allen Stone Gallery in New York, the Denver Art Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, the Miami Project, and the Santa Fe Institute of Art. In, in uh, 2016, she, her work was the focus of a 25-year retrospective at the Boulder Art Museum of Contemporary Art. Martha's work is also in many private and public collections, including the Denver Art Museum, and has public art pieces in Denver, Castle Rock, and Fort Collins. She's also a member of Art Knots, which is a socially and politically art-based collective. Uh, during her time with Art Knots, she's shown work in over 280 exhibitions in 23 countries. Over the last 12 years, Martha's served as the president of the nonprofit collective. She's also served on the board of directors for the Scintilla Foundation and the board and the Boulder Museum of Art, Contemporary Art, and Swoon International Residency Program. In addition to her studio practice, Martha is a lecturer at the University of Colorado in Boulder in the Art and Art History Department and the College of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, prior to her time at the University of Colorado, she taught at Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design in Denver for 18 years. She lives in the mountains just near Boulder with her husband, Joe Ryan, where they raised their daughter, Odelia, and their son, Henry. Um, so Martha's lecture is in conjunction with her exhibition, Seishura, which is in the Marie Walsh Sharp Gallery of Contemporary Art, and it's on view until December 2nd, so please take a second to head over to the gallery. The gallery will be open today till 7.30, so you can pop over there right after the lecture. Um, you, we'll have some time after the lecture if you have a question for Martha that she can answer some questions about the show. Um, we have a catalog for the exhibition coming very soon, so if you're interested in purchasing a copy of that catalog, please get in touch with me or one of our other staff members, or you can email us at gallery at uccs.edu uh, to get a pre-order in, so it's going to... Beautiful. So, just that's my little plug for that. Um, so now that's enough of me. So help me welcome Martha Russo. Wow, what a welcome! Gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do next here, but I just cannot thank UCCS and Goka. David, Lene, Abigail, Joy, I've had, I've been in, very fortunate to be in lots of exhibitions, but literally by far this has been the smoothest run of one of the most difficult installs I've ever had in my life. So I cannot thank them enough. And I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. What we're going to do is I'm going to give you a little background about what is important to me and how it kind of filters through my work and my life, and then we'll really look carefully at the pieces in Sejura. And that is how you say it, Sejura. All right, so here we go. So here are the roots of it all. As Lene said, I grew up in Milford, Connecticut, right on Long Island Sound, and it was our job to go to the beach with my two brothers and sister. And this was the best day, getting a blowfish and touching it and watching it blow up the whole day. Another great day was squid fishing. Squid are really important in my Italian background, you'll see. And I think what, what growing up at the beach and going every day was all about the anticipating discoveries. And this is the kind of thing that is, that is a thread through all of my work and it's what I want you as a viewer to get when you see my work, not quite knowing where something is or what something is, like this thing. I found this on the beach, I cut it open, it ended up it was a buoy. I was like, oh, what a great day. And then, but, but there's stuff everywhere. I was in McGuckin's the other day and there was this amazing shelf of these mushroom growing kits. So it's, it's not the location, it's just the matter of, of, of keeping an eye out anywhere I go to find things. Now, more roots of all of us. I studied developmental biology and psychology as an undergrad, and I was enchanted and still am by the way the body works. It just doesn't make sense to me that this all works 
incredibly quickly and seamlessly if everything's working well. I was particularly interested in the two types of nervous systems and especially the autotonic nervous system, which is the closest thing to what makes us an animal. And it's the thing that tells us to either stay with something or go. So a lot of my work, sometimes I'm trying to push this trigger and, oh, with this piece plug, many people leave. And, and, it, and I'm hoping to create a visceral response using materials. This is mostly clay, but the end of that piece is a big pomegranate and three Italian grapes held on by pig intestine. And as soon as people read that it's pig intestine, everybody backs up even a little bit further. So I want people to really feel like they're trying to figure out what's going on. This was an amazing day. In, in the last century when I was an undergrad, scanning electron microscopes were just coming in. And the day this professor of mine showed us what a cell looked like, I was like, oh my God, how could this be? These little things are the building blocks. That, that create all of us. And, and so much of that runs through my work, as you'll see. Like I like to make lot, lot, take lots of little things to make bigger structures. But what I really love are glitches. And the glitches create these strange patterns and, of course, not great things either. Breast cancer here on the left and tuberculosis here on the right. But things like an aneurysm, this is what it looks like popping out of a blood vessel. And it all relates on this micro-macro scale that's quite interesting. Um, the glitch that started the art making, as Lene said, all I loved to do growing up is I played tons of sports all through high school and then had the great fortune of coming to the Olympic Training Center when I was in 11th grade and, and vying for a spot on the Olympic team. But my legs just weren't going to do it. I, I kept injuring my knee and the doctor said, no long, you, you really, you're, you can't finish the trials for LA Olympics and you can't play again a running sport. And I was like, what? What am I going to do with myself when my friends are going to practice? So I dove into ceramics and this is a piece like I just played games with myself to see what I could make in a day or just trying to get myself tired in lots of ways. And what I loved about ceramics too, it has this beautiful internal cellular lo logic. Like on the left, that's porcelain magnifying 6,000 times. And if you've ever touched porcelain, it's very smooth and it, and it kind of gives and that totally makes sense that it would be these plates. And sculpture clay is on the right, which is kind of craggy and that allows you to build forms that are bigger. So the combination of this cellular sort of internal logic, and I love the periodic table um, and, and how chemicals react with heat. So I, I've been in heaven working with ceramic materials for almost 40 years now. I know you're probably trying to do the math because I look really young, but, um, no, I'm kidding. But, but I really call it this endless, endless journey that is really about what I like to call generative proliferations. One thing adds to the next. So I started, so much of my work is about visualizing a feeling located somewhere in the body. And this started when I was in grad school um, at, at, this is the old building, the Civil Wool Building, which I kind of love because we could wreck it anytime we wanted, not the new building. The new building's too fancy. But when I went to, um, got into school, I was 33 years old. I had taken one uh, medieval art, hi art history class and I had no idea what everybody was talking about. It was the height of postmodernism. I didn't even know what modernism was. And I did not think I was going to make it through that first year. And my husband, the Saint Joe Ryan, he said, what's your problem? Just trust your gut. Like, I don't, I don't even know what, what you're talking about. Get in your studio and start working. I was like, okay. So I started making these pieces that were, had nothing to do with my head and nothing to do below my waist so I couldn't run away. That was like my little game. And for three months, I made these forms. I started with a, a piece of clay that was the length of my spine. And then I was like, wow, these look familiar. This is exactly how you grow. You have a head and then you have your, your spinal column and then you have this, you know, pelvic cavity. It got me back looking at all my books and especially my, this amazing anatomy book of real cadavers and looking at stomachs. Like, trust your gut. That was my motto. And I started making these small little 
tiny belly forms that were about different emotions that I was feeling as I was going through school. Pink belly, blue belly. And then looking, the reason why your stomach reacts to things, it has these mesh of um, muscles that are encasing the stomach and they're attached to your organs. And basically, again, if you're in a fight or flight situation, the muscles just react and your stomach actually changes size about 70 times a day, depending on how tired you are, how much water, and if you're seeing some weird sculpture. Um, so what I started doing was I started wrapping pieces, these, these forms I'd been making in string and trying to make this sinuous kind of surface. And it was the first time I was playing with porcelain slip and I kind of got addicted to it as you'll see later. Now, yuck, look at this. This is what your gallbladder looks like. And, and it's only about this big and, it, and it, it basically holds the nastiest things in your body. And when I had to give the first talk about my work, I was so scared to death, and I subsequently had to give it about four or five more times because of my great professor, Scott Chamberlain, said, this is not going to do. And I, so to celebrate, when I did finally get the talk done, I made this piece of Vegas, and it's about four feet tall, and at the end, I, I, I made my own little... Um, gallbladder, like, oh God, thank God this thing is over. And it really felt good to make that work. And it still holds true with me. When, when something's going on and I'm trying to figure something out, if I can see it, I feel better. So I liken my process to kind of sine, cosine. When you're down below the line, I don't want anybody in my studio. I got to just really make, make, make. Then I come up for air a little. I see some trends. I do a little research. I go back down, refine, and then maybe think about context and showing. But sometimes stuff does not make it out of the studio. Lots of experimenting. So early in my making life, I made discrete objects. And then I'd say about 12 years ago, with an invitation from the Denver Art Museum to be in a show called Clay Overthrown Without Limits. They invited a number of us um, from around the country to do the craziest things we could with clay. I had the great first fortune of collaborating with Katie Karen, um, and we created this piece, Apoptosis. Apoptosis is a system in your body that cleans out old cells. It's a programmed cell death. And if it works brilliantly, you're gonna be really healthy. And if it doesn't, you could be sliding down this 30 foot wall and not know where you're gonna end up. And so Katie and I combined these sort of beautiful lit forms um, made of translucent porcelain and cast paper over weather balloons. And they sort of moved down this slope and it really became more of a junkyard towards the end. I was in charge of the junkyard happily, I must tell you. And it's the first time I really investigated what metal and clay do together. And the last piece I made here on the right, I actually burned the parts of a kiln into the piece and it was very satisfying to me. So ultimately, what, what I liked, what we both loved about this is people could read it bottom to top or top to bottom. And it was really interesting hearing all the different interpretations. And that richness of not telling people the whole story is something that I try to do all the time in my work. The other thing I learned about doing these, uh, this extensive installation, poor Katie was pregnant. She actually had her little girl Zoe the second week of the install and she missed out on all the fun being on the lift. So I kind of got this like taste of, wow, it's really fun to make work together. And that, that is definitely true of the anatomy of Sejura. So let's go into the show here. First, when, when um, Daisy invited me to have the show and Joy was the co-curator, they gave me such freedom in letting me choose the work, which doesn't always happen when you work with the curator. I want this, I want that. They said, what are, you, what are you thinking about? And I said, I'm thinking about everything that's in between things. And those things are inside and outside. I want to have a piece like inside the gallery and going outside. Um, male and female body forms and everything in between macro and micro worlds. Things that are in between the forest and the sea and holding on and letting go. 
And I looked a long time for words, and I found words that meant that, but they didn't sound as good as sejura. And one of my great friends, who's a psychoanalytic um, Jungian analyst, she said, oh, it's all about sejura. So basically, it's in Greek and Latin verse, it's a break between words within a metrical foot. And that means there's a flow and a rhythm, and then all of a sudden there's a pause. And I love this idea because that's what all, I want all my work to do for anybody who comes into it is be like, what is going on? Like phase shift waddling, what the heck does that mean? So here's what happened 10 years ago. We had a massive flood in Jamestown Canyon, which is the canyon up to our home northwest of Boulder. There were 41 breaks in the road, and the road was out of commission for uh, 10 months. Once they started rebuilding it, there was a single lane and only residents could go up. And I have to say, it was absolutely inspiring to see how they were rebuilding the roads. And then all of a sudden, I'm starting to see these things, and, they, and I didn't know what they were called. I asked the construction guys, and they're like, oh, they're waddles. We, we can't work without them. And basically, they are staked into the ground. I'm sure you've seen them in places, but it basically helps re re you know, firm up earth that's been, been, that's been disrupted. So I was like, those poor wattles look like they hurt, that stake going in. And I had this idea of freeing the wattle. I want to make the wattle do something it never can do. So with my dear friend Elizabeth, we went out to Aspen Wood Products where they make wattles. And these are made with shredded aspen trees in a little town called Mancus, which is really, really about, about an hour west of Durango. Oh my God, it's incredible. And I love seeing how stuff is made. Like, you know, Mr. Rogers, when he go to like the balloon factory, that, that was like the best day for me. But, but here were these stacks of aspen trees that they have to dry for eight years before they, they can put them through the shredder. And then they're stuffed into plastic netting and, and then coiled up put on pallets, and then there is just this massive amount of these going out into the world. because they're, and, and they cannot keep them stocked at this point because of all the flooding and the crazy stuff that's going on with the weather. So I went to my studio and I was like, ooh, I love these things. They can fly, they can do all sorts of stuff. And then when Daisy said, hey, do you wanna do a piece in the building? I, I was like, oh yeah. This is an amazing hallway. So lots of just little sketches, and I thought, I wanted to go look like they're going through the wall of the gallery and then have some eep out into the gallery somehow. Now how the heck to do that was starting um, thinking about all different kinds of armatures that might work. And after many, many discussions with, with um, Daryl Yi, who is the engineer for the building, he signs off on everything. We came up with a system, but he said, I need you to test it. So luckily, I have a fabulous friend, Patrick Marold, who lent me this barn brought up materials to mimic the walls of the outdoor space and the gallery, and then started bringing all the waddles up. And then, of course, you enlist your favorite friends to help, like Elizabeth, one of my friends from graduate school. And these were the tests we came up with. And it was working. Things were holding. I would come and take pictures once a week, send them to Daryl. He then kept saying, I think we're in good shape. Let's do it. So... After that, I basically made a checklist of all the different forms that I thought I might need. But again, you can get as ready as you can, but once you get to the install, there's so much that happens. So here come the waddles. Um, we had, we had uh, seven pallets, and there were just some amazing image taking going on, because how weird is this? It's pretty exciting. Um, all the metal rods, 230 metal rods fabricated, uh, two feet to eight feet. And then the biggest thing our students helped us with, and I don't know if they were really signing on for this, but they stayed, and I cannot tell you how happy I am they did, is we cut them up into different lengths, and then they were threaded onto the rods, was, which was like an Olympic sport, let me tell you. And then we stockpiled all different types and sizes, and then with the incredible help of Lene and, and Hossein, who's in from the theater department, With two lifts, we started going down the hallway and putting them up. And there were just so many great moments because these things were really floating around and free and having a blast instead of being staked into the ground. 
So I could have never imagined that this would be how it would have come out because one idea, it's that generative proliferation. One idea led to another. This is the burger of Calais, like all the, you know, the mayors standing over. So we're making up names. In the morning, I'm asking the students to make like, you know, fiddleheads and jelly rolls, and we're making up all these nomenclatures. And then we're actually using the raw aspen to make some different configurations. But what I have loved, um, is just letting people's imaginations go wild. I was telling my friends earlier, these two little kids were looking at it and I overheard them and, and they said, you know, this kind of looks like my grandma's hair in the morning. <laughs> and, and, and then another woman said, no, 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 this is so creepy to me. I feel like these are big worms and they're gonna get me. So the, the vastness of interpretation is, is something that I love about making work that's abstract enough that you can't name it. But, but not so obscure that you run away. And then we, we were lucky we could um, make more pieces outside and um, have this kind of flow and continue. This is gonna be incredible with uh, the snow coming up and what, how this will unfurl over the next couple months. The piece inside will be up for two years and we're gonna see how things go with the piece outside. And I think what has been so shocking and amazing is seeing this from the highway and having, I've gotten so many crazy emails and said, is that where your show is? It kind of looks like something you might be interested in doing. I'm like, oh, I think so. And the building is so fantastic, like the backdrop, just, just incredible. And then we, got, we, we had a three week install for the hallway and outside, and then we had three weeks off, this is so civilized, I can't tell you, to start installing the gallery. And I love this idea that we could make it simulate that it was going through the wall and then exiting on the far right. So I could not be happier with the waddles. And again, it was a really Herculean effort. Now let's take a look at lacuna. Lacuna is another word that means there's a break in something. And it was formerly known as nomo cylinder. And here's why. When I was in graduate school, I made this little thing. And this was a way for me to test glazes. I, I rolled it out really quickly, put toilet paper in it, and I could stand it up in the kiln. Right before my, the summer before my graduate show, I had plenty of work and I didn't feel like I had time to start a new body of work. So I just thought, I'm gonna make these things. I don't know what they are, I kinda like them. I'm gonna make them all different shapes, straight, curved to the right, curved to the left, fiddlehead, all this stuff. And basically, the waddle piece is just a massive piece of these, honestly. Like my friend Julie was saying, I have two ideas and I just keep reworking them. And this is pretty much is what, what's been going on. But after I had literally used almost two tons of clay that summer, I thought, wow, I kind of want to make it feel like a school of squid. So I came up with this first rendition that I call nomos, which is a Greek word for the word nomad that means wander and wonder. And it's 10 feet high, about 18 feet long. And when you're in the curve of the corner of a wall, you really do feel inundated. My gallery at that time said, this is ridiculous. It takes about 70 hours to put up. She said, what can you make in a day? And I said, how about nomos cube? And how about nomos core? And how about nomos dots? And, and she said, this is getting easier for us to figure out how to, how to maybe help you have a living with your work. Um, and then the last rendition was at my show at BMOCA, the 25th anniversary, or 25 years of work, I should say. I really wanted to envelop the viewer in the whole space and make and create a space. So I created this called Nomos Curve, and we had to build the wall. Um, and figure out a way to put them up really, really fast, which is a technique that now I employ versus it used to be pegboard disguised by paper, which was really archaic when I think about doing that. Um, people either love this piece, it was a fight or flight idea going on, or felt really uncomfortable knowing that they're fragile and they were kind of coming at you. But um, it's, it, was, it was really wonderful to see that. But then, 
Here's what happened. My husband and I had sabbatical in Northern California at Humboldt State University, and I was so smitten by the trees. And if any of you've ever, like, it's, it's nothing that you can ever, ever explain to anybody. And not only the big trees standing up, but I was really taken by the fallen giants. And, and I thought to myself, like, the pressure that you feel that that is against you. I want to make, make a nomos piece like that. So I started calling it nomos cylinder. And I thought, I, I have enough pieces to cover a 12-foot long, five-foot high piece. And, but I knew I wanted to make it a little bit different, kind of join the o- ocean with the forest. So I started taking a million images of different mushrooms and and started learning about moss and, and, and just thought, okay, that, that's what I'll do. I'll make these mossy forms. So here's out in our driveway in front of my studio, the first run through. And I felt like the scale, it's all I could do with the equipment I had at CU Boulder. And now, now it's a matter of getting the right foam, working with foam distributors in Longmont. And I didn't have a big enough studio to make the whole 12 foot long piece. Thank goodness. I love it when your space constricts you and the next thing you know, you're doing something you wouldn't do. So I thought, I'm gonna make a four foot piece and, and I'm reglazing, I'm, I'm learning all moss and all, and then I'm getting really, really, really addicted to making very small ball forms and, and all sorts of things. And, and loving just how the kiln itself looks. Like I love taking pictures of the kiln. I know that's kind of geeky, but it's like a framework. It's like this small, little, beautiful painting. So now, Nomo Cylinder, part one, is starting to get populated. I'm starting to enjoy all the new vocabulary. But more than anything, I really like the scale of this piece. I call up Joy and Lene, and I said, you know what? I think we got to break up the, the long 12-footer and make two. And, they, and everybody was like, okay. And it meant I had to really make a lot more pieces, which of course I love that because I like making a lot of stuff. So I tested the whole thing at a friend of mine's gallery, Seidel City, at Terry Seidel's place, because I had to make sure I had enough pieces. And I had to, I had to practice it because there'd be no way I would have the aesthetic agility and the aesthetic, like, you know, really just powering on to put up this big show. So took it all down, shipped it down here, and this is what it looks like. So there's 173 boxes. All the pieces are sorted by color and demeanor. And then fabulous Abigail and the staff, they helped get everything out and put them in smaller boxes so we could maneuver around the piece a little bit better. And then, The way it works is you start from the top and then you slowly get down because you box yourself out. The pieces are too fragile to have a ladder too close by. Um, That the, right, what you're seeing here, those are all the, what I call the bark forms. Um, That, all of those just fit on the end of the big cylinder. So when you go in tonight, that's how many pieces it takes. Now this is where I need to really get my old art pals to come, Rebecca D. Domenico, Elizabeth Fallhaber, and I just kind of let them go to town and then I sort of come through and go, oh, we gotta make this a little thicker, a little richer here, whatever it is. So the way I thought about where do I put the pieces, I wanted to kind of trick everybody. Oh, here's another one of these Nomos pieces, right? So I had the first view be almost all the old pieces. Now these are 30 years old, some of these pieces from grad school. But I I had this little indication of this orange with these kind of a wet, wet glaze that almost looks like it had rained. And that was the cue, hey, something different is going on. You know, make sure you check this thing out. And I'm totally toying with everybody's nervous system because once you know something, you don't look as carefully, but as soon as you don't know it, you you get more activated and alert. Um, So there's the bark at the end on that that left-hand side, and I put it next to the blue. And this was a really rich, rich palette for me. I normally keep my palette kind of subdued because we as animals see things in black and white, and color is a little distracting in a way. It's almost too easy. But not this time. I became friends with orange, and orange likened to me 
one of the most fantastic little surprises in the forest that's mostly green and brown, and you get this amazing hit of orange. So this, this has been a real, real eye-opener for me, loving orange. Um, and Lene took this beautiful photograph. I just have to have a shout out to Lene and Wes Magyar who really captured the show. All right, on to pensum. Pensum is a Latin word that means you're obligated. You can't get out of it. And sometimes it's a, it's a kind of a harsh word. Like it's almost like uh, you're being punished. But for me, this was a word that came up when Marty Goff from the former curator at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art said, you know what, if you had to make one piece where your work comes, what would it be? And I said, oh, it's just like this Anish Kapoor piece. It's called When I Am Pregnant. And I'm like, wow, that is so cool. It just came out from the wall. And I thought, I'm going to make a clear one, and I'm going to put ev a layer of every single work I've ever made in it. So I kind of made this goofy little geog, you know, like strata and of all the different periods of making. And I thought, we're going to put it in the window, and then we're going to layer in these pieces. So I, I worked with a, um, uh, a skylight company to learn how to do it and then enlisted Demiurge fabricators in North Denver to help me actually make the pieces. Made a kiln, and then we heated up the acrylic, and then I pushed these forms in that are from this friend of mine from grad school, Lars Westby. Sometimes one form, sometimes two forms, sometimes bigger, smaller, and here was the best part. We only had 40 seconds to work, and it was completely instinctual, and when it was done, it was done. And you'll see, and then when I got them back to my studio, I put the first one up and I said, oh, this is it. I can't put anything in there. It, the, the light is so beautiful, that's all I need. So we made seven of them, and Joy and Lene and Abigail came up to Boulder, and we picked these four, because they had a different thing to say. Each one of them has a little bit different form, a little bit different feeling, um, and here's the sejura, this space between male and female, and, and kind of this diaphanous, you can't quite even focus on what is going on. And what we did is we lined them up so that they would play with each other in addition to being singular objects. And I have to say, you know, I, I made these pieces in 2015, and to see them for the first time like this has just been absolute magic. And the, the beauty of the light hitting them and all the different surprises, I tell you, it's just like being at the beach. It's, it's all over that discovery. All right, let's go on to incubo, Latin for incubate. COVID was very nice to my family. Nobody was ill. We all stayed healthy. And it was the most time I've had since graduate school to work continuously on my work. And I have to say, I loved it. And I started with um, this piece. I had made this piece, oh, probably in 2012. And I had never had a chance to really investigate it. And basically, it's a protea flower. I had dipped it in porcelain slip. And I knew, because how dense those flowers are, the slip would not get all the way in, and the flower would fall apart. And I was like, you know, I kind of want to freeze that falling apart. So I made this little round dish. I put tons of glaze in it, let it go. And here's, here's kind of what it looked like. Now, and then I just got on a tear. I just kept, I was making tons of these dishes. But, but the picture on the left is what it looks like before it goes in the kiln. And then after, things decay, things like bleed into each other. It's amazing, it's super fun. And then what I did, I actually had a fractured shoulder from playing a little ice hockey and I could only use my right arm two hours a day. And it was the best, it was the best parameter because the rest of the day, I totally cleaned my studio with my left hand. And I found all these old pieces, this old piece I made, um, at, that was made out of self-glazing clay, Egyptian paste, and I started just making Petri dishes and giving them a new life. And again, those two ideas, like that freedom of freeing up something that's been in, the, in a drawer for like 10 years or 15 years, I was having a heyday. But then the disturbing thing, listening to NPR and how COVID attacked people's lungs. 
And it was really tough listening to the descriptions. I started making lungs. I looked at my, my old books. And the description from this one doctor was, imagine having thousands and thousands of nails nailed into the bottom of your lungs until you can't breathe anymore. And I was like, oh, that is horrible. And there we go. Here are the nails. And then here they are fired. So it was a combination of playing around and then trying to get through COVID. So here's what transpired for uh, Sejura, these beautiful tables with these uh, one inch thick glass. And again, couldn't predict these incredible shadows. And then it just sort of flowed. I brought about a hundred of the dishes. We picked up about 62 of them and gave them a sense of formal quality, like just that these two might be a mirror image. And then really just relishing in the beauty and the, and the just, absolute generosity of the kiln and all sorts of um, chemicals. And then the sad COVID table, um, I, I continue to make pieces like when hearing descriptions, how your brain actually feels porous from what COVID does. And this was the toughest one for me. Um, the Hearing the descriptions of people dying in the ICU and no one could come in. And I was like, what does that look like? And this to me was what it looked like. So the table kind of brings you in and out, but the hope is you're just discovering the whole time. All right, last piece, shoot. Oh, shoot, is that what it's about? And this is the most literal title I've ever, ever had. And it's because I do have a tendency to get hurt. And this was that, this was another, my poor right shoulder froze up when I was getting ready for that show at Bimoka. And I was like, damn, I, I don't know what to do. But I have to say, going to the doctor, I kind of like it. It's a little weird, but I talk to them forever. They're like, whoa, this lady, let's get her out of here. <laughs> I, I actually take a ton of pictures of all the models. And then I kind of go home and I get to learn about a different part of my body, I've heard. And, and then everything starts to look like the shoulder to me. Here's this this potato I found at the bottom of the bowl. I'm like, wait a minute, that's perfect. So I start peeling it and then I get it ready to dip and slip it. Oh, go for a walk. Those look like all my frayed and ragged tendons and different muscle tissue. And that's what it said. I'd like to look at words in, in, in different things and say, and try to turn them into something visual. So I started dipping these things in slip and, um, Rope, uh, ropes were my tendons and ligaments that were very, very upset. That's what my doctor told me. She's like, he's like, what are you doing? And I said, let's go to my website. And he'd be like, you need assistance. That, that was one guy. And the last thing I made for this was I went to a sports chiropractor to try to help straighten out my spine. And he likened older spines to dried up sponges. And I thought, perfect. What do you do with those old kitchen sponges but make your spine? So now down the chute, it's got a bad, bad, sad connotation. Like you are really going down the tubes and there's nothing you can do. But I was like, no way. I'm going to make something that I don't go down the chute all the way. I'm going to make this plate form. And it was actually one of the first plate forms, again, that relates to Incubo. And I wanted it to be kind of a long, long slog that you could, you could kind of slow it down, but inevitably gravity is pulling you. So I came up with this idea of this... Um, 12 foot aluminum chute that'd be wider at the top. And then this was a great day when I figured out, wow, I think this thing is gonna work. And it's actually one of my, my most favorite pieces I think I've ever made. There's something about it, it's mysterious. It is very macabre in some ways, but there's that play between life and death. Heraclides, a Greek philosopher, talked about how everything is just a hair away from the opposite. And you know, got to get used to it, right? And we got to, one of my friends says getting old is just getting the matter, getting the right equipment. And I kind of feel like with my, my titanium knee and my titanium hip, and soon this will be titanium, that it's fine, you know? And, and, and it's kind of interesting to me. Again, I know that's sort of weird, but, um, and I'm really, really appreciative of all the medical care I've gotten and the amazing PT people who tend to come to my shows and they're asking me if I'm sitting up straight, all these things. So there's the spine right at the end. 
Okay, so now what is going on after the opening? Time to absorb. The opening was fantastic. I usually don't like openings because I just can't wait till everybody's gone and nothing is broken. But Lene and Abigail and the incredible staff took such good care of the work. They let people get close, but they, they were very cognizant. And they had an extraordinary photographer at the opening taking really phenomenal pictures. Now, Garrison Roots, one of my sculpture professors in graduate school, who's sadly no longer with us, he said, look, if you want to be an artist, it's not a sprint. It's a, it's a long distance running. And if you don't believe in yourself, no one will believe in you. And you'll, you'll never get anywhere. And at the opening, I've had that feeling that people, after 30 years of making, they believed in me. And I had the great chance with Daisy and Joy to thank them, and, and we just had a ball. Just, it, was a, it was an incredible, joyous event. And Lene and Abigail, and since then, I've tried to count up how many people have helped me with, with my show here. And this is the diagram in my journal. Um, and it's over 150 people. And, and now, luckily, over this four months, I'm also creating documents in my journal that help me remember what the heck I did. Because it, it takes, you know, there's so many steps. The other thing is just having a blast, having my family and dear friends and getting a little silly with these beautiful hats that we found and just celebrating the, the show, which has just been amazing. Um, but Pike's Peak is really critical to me when I think about the loop that's just sort of taken its toll. When, um, you know, when I came out here the first time at the Olympic Center, it's the first time I'd seen the Rocky Mountains and our field was in the shadows of Pike's Peak that you see in the background. And, and I never ever thought I would get over, you know, not playing and different things. But now here we are in the shadow of Pike's Peak with this crazy piece of mine. And I, I, I was really fortunate my teammates came out and here we were celebrating this goal by Carrie Mulhern, I'll never forget it. We, we beat Harvard, we hate them. And, um, <laughs> and, and I just remember like this was it and here they all were with me and here's, all, and here's the new team. Like I feel like I have the sense of the team really being alive and well. And, and this was an amazing gathering with some of the students. We had lunch together and talking about the show and how you talk about the work. And then Abigail comes out with this, a cake that looks like <laughs> Lacuna. And look at this thing, it is so brilliant. She's got all the colors, she's got everything. And I'm like, when, I'm like Abigail, how long did that take? And she said, not as long as it took you to make yours. <laughs> it's brilliant. So I'm infinitely grateful for everybody and the team work that I really feel like you have to really trust people if you're gonna have a good team. And it makes me think, where does the feeling of being honored and graced live in and out of the body? And what does that look like? And that's what I'm starting to think about for some new pieces next as we go on. Thank you very much.